A year ago, uh, we were the first to raise our voice and say the government needs to stop dithering and start drilling. Everything about this rails against the instincts of the Conservative Party, and to be blunt, also the, the mainstream of the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats, all of whom have been flirting with nimbyism for about 20 to 30 years and essentially turning this country into a place where nothing can ever get done. To discuss the government's energy policies, I'm very excited to be joined by my colleague Andy Mayer, and is our Chief Operating Officer here at the IEA as well as an energy analyst. He has extensive experience advising energy companies. Andy, thanks so much for joining. Afternoon, Matt. So, what has Liz Truss actually announced? What, what did she say in her statement and what does it mean for people? So, broadly, there's two areas to the policy announcement. One on the demand side, which is what everybody has seen, has attracted most of the commentary and amounts to a freezing of energy prices under the guarantee. And then on the other part of it, which has had very little discussion whatsoever, is the supply side measures, which we can come to later. Mm. But the price guarantee itself should be considered to be a political measure, not good economics. And it's interesting to see that the government has been attacked by think tanks and commentators from across the political spectrum, all highlighting very similar problems with the guarantee, which we can now go into. Take it away. So, fundamentally, this is an inefficient way of helping people with their energy bills. The politics of it are simple and brilliant. And that's really what the government has gone for. They needed some big bang solution to this looming disaster of rapidly rising energy bills that were coming down the line for the October rise in the energy price cap that existed previously. Now, to be clear, that is replaced by this, but it's a pretty similar thing. Rather than the prices moving on a three monthly basis, the government simply said, yep, we're going to keep them moving, but they can go no higher than about £2,500. Oh, and by the way, you get a bit of a rebate as well for the first part of it. So they'll go down to about 2100 for that period. And you are protected. But that's not quite true. So what's actually being capped underneath all of this, and we are still waiting for the final detail, is the wholesale price. And the wholesale price of heating, roughly speaking, is gas, but not quite. It's about 85% of it. And the wholesale price of power is electricity and how it is generated, in which it's about 40% gas power, about 30 to 40% renewables, then nuclear and a few other bits and bobs. Not very much coal, if any, at all left on the system. So broadly speaking, you've got a massive amount of gas that goes into heating, particularly in winter, and you've got a small amount, smaller amount of gas that goes into power, and it's gas prices that are driving the underlying cost of energy and driving them to an ever higher level because of the war in Ukraine, the return to normal from the pandemic, and often forgotten, just globally rising demand for energy, because quite reasonably, large parts of the world that are developing want to have the same standards of living as we do. So it's not actually the case that your bills will be £2,500 if you're a household, and goodness knows what if you're a business. It means that the unit price you're paying will be capped off such that if you were a typical household, that's what you'd pay. And so obviously Liz Truss has made this announcement. It's, it's gotten a lot of platitudes. And it's something that is perceived to be very popular. And, and I think historically price controls generally are very popular. People like the idea of not having to pay more for something. You know, if you're asked in a, in a survey uh, poll question saying, do you want to pay more for something or do you want to not pay more for something? I think people rationally are saying, I don't want to pay more for something. But from an economic perspective, we know price controls tend to have unintended consequences. And I just want to unpack what kind of price control this is, because I think it's quite unique in a sense, which is the, the government is intending to pick up the gap uh, and at quite a large cost to the taxpayer of the difference between what we pay and then the cost on the wholesale market. Now, there are some on the left side of politics saying, well, actually, this isn't real socialism. Real socialism would be um, big windfall taxes to make uh, the energy companies pay for the, the, the cost of freezing prices, uh, as, as, as well as not doing what we could consider a kind of corporate socialism, as in a big transfer from taxpayers to these energy 
companies. Now, I, I've kind of just said, why do we think the government didn't go down that track? What, what, what would have happened if the government said, actually, no, what we're going to do is we're not just going to cap the price you pay, but we're not going to offer any wholesale subsidies um, to the energy companies to buy the gas that, that, that they need to buy. We're, we're not going to deal with that side of the equation. We're just going to say, we, we simply refuse to pay what the market price is for these things. We think there's just profiteering going on from these energy companies. In fact, they're making big profits. They shouldn't be making those profits. Um, we're we're going to freeze the wholesale price as well as what we pay at the retail level. And, and I'm sure our friends uh, on the other, other side of this debate would say that would solve all the problems and wouldn't cost anything. So, OK, so let's unpack that. So classic socialism is state ownership. And if we go back to Jeremy Corbyn, then they were talking about nationalising the energy companies. And this clearly isn't that. Socialist price controls is nearer to the mark. And that's where the government says, as you noted, uh, this is what we are prepared to pay, take it or leave it. And the problem with socialist price controls is that you end up with shortages. So in the classic sense, you end up, as they have in Venezuela, with people queuing for food, the lights going out, the water not being there when people need it, and so on. And clearly, our government didn't go down that route. They understood that the fundamental thing that loses elections is the lights going out, blackouts, freeze-outs, people feeling insecure. So security of supply is protected. So this is still a pretty socialist model. And it's corporate socialism, as you described. It's the transfer from future taxpayers of an unknown sum of money to large corporations in the energy sector who are under no pressure whatsoever to be more efficient, no pressure to help people reduce their use. And fundamentally, the socialist aspect of it is that the price mechanism has been destroyed. There is no market mechanism going on here other than the very loosest possible sense if prices drop below the cap. So we have this socialist price system and corporate socialism on the other side of the equation. And the amount of money that will be transferred is unknowable because it depends on volatile international and regional prices, particularly for gas. So we think the range is going to be somewhere in between 90 billion to 170 billion. And that's more expensive. If it's at the upper end, it's more expensive than the bank bailout. And if it's at the lower end, it's still more expensive than the furlough scheme. So this is a massive intervention in the economy. And one in which the government is gambling that the Ukraine war will end, that the global supply of gas will increase. And in fact, by the end of it, it'll cost a lot less than we feared. And people will be keen to return to a market having experienced this rather odd and uncomfortable situation. So I think the best case for this is probably, well, it'll keep down inflation, at least the not actual inflation, but the CPI measure there of inflation. Um, it's politically simple and easy. It's practically um, something you can do with, with relatively limited effort. But in, in an ideal world, Andy, of course, um, and even I, I suspect in this government's ideal world, based upon what they were saying uh, not too long ago, freezing prices is, is a terrible solution to this problem. What would have been a better way in, in the short term demand perspective from a, from a market perspective? to respond to this historic increase in prices? So letting the market work in this situation would have maintained price pressure to reduce energy use. So if you know that your energy bill is going to be £3,500 next month and then possibly five to £6,000 next year, you're definitely going to think about ways of reducing your energy where you can. But obviously you can't if you are poor, vulnerable, have very limited means to invest in new solutions. But we do want richer people and more successful businesses investing in those things, so heat pumps, insulation, solar thermal on their roof, that kind of stuff. And all of that pressure is gone. If you're somebody with a leaky home, if you're running a hot tub or a swimming pool, just keep going. The government's going to let you put all that cost on future generations. And that's what's really bad about it. It's a, it's a regressive policy one in which sends entirely the wrong signals. Which remember the people who use the most energy at the moment and will get the most benefit out of this are richer households, big, bigger households mm -hmm. that uh, do have things like swimming pools and, and hot tubs. Um, and we're removing the incentive to for them, as you've said, to reduce their energy use by, by not letting it. But I think at the same time, for a lot of people, they they, they say, although our colleague Chris Snowden put quite 
well that well the, if the, the median income is around thirty thousand pounds a year, um, the the median household should more or less be able to afford it. But there are, as you've as you've said, a lot of households that probably couldn't afford that, um, who would see higher energy bills and would have to simply um, either stop paying or they'd have to uh, not heat their homes in the, in the heights of winter, and it could lead to quite tragic outcomes for those people. What what would be the market solution there? Well. It's often misunderstood that liberals and libertarians are not opposed to welfare. Even Hayek wrote that welfare was something that should be considered in a prosperous society as a way of addressing the worst excesses of the marketplace and brute bad luck. And this is both. It's brute bad luck with the war and it's a marketplace delivering the conclusion of that. And there, if we simply use the measures we already had, universal credit, rapidly increasing it to offset the cost of rising energy... The warm home discount was the one that Stephen Littlechild suggested might be used in a targeted way. That would be a good way of getting help to the most vulnerable, but wouldn't necessarily help those people who are right on the edge of eligibility, so just outside the welfare system, but still not high income earners. There you need a combination of other things. Now there you might need to think about direct transfers in some way of a new scheme. You certainly look at tax cuts, that helps everybody who's working. And tax cuts of a different nature would help businesses facing higher bills. So do we still need to have very high levels of business rates, for example, employers' national insurance? So we came up with a package of measures that amounted to about £90 billion worth of spending that we think would have been a more effective way of doing this. But in reality, the government could have come up with a more complex package, but it decided it didn't have time, and that's why it went for this scheme. Yeah, some of the arguments made is effectively the policy is decided by the database you have, and the government lacked the ability to target support. Do you, do you buy that as an argument? Because I'm not sure I do. I think th- there, there were ways, and in fact the government had already provided previous payments, not ideally, but th- th- to people on who are in homes in certain council bounds, to people on universal credit, there does feel like there's at least some capacity already there to increase existing payments and target support. I think it could do more, and I think there is something in the database argument But fundamentally, if you decide that the sole thing that matters is relieving people of the pressure of this shock to the energy system, then you're going to go down this route. If you think that it matters to reduce energy demand, and the real disaster, to be clear, uh, is that everybody across Europe is trying something similar to this. So energy is going to stay high across the entire region throughout the winter period, which could then lead to a situation where there isn't enough gas. If you decide that's the way you're going to go, then you're not going to have the targeted system. Well, yeah, I think I think this does raise the very real possibility of, of blackouts during during winter. If a whole range of countries, particularly ones that we um, have transmitters with, if they stop supplying to the UK, and similarly that there's a lack of um, domestic supply in the UK, it's it's very easy to imagine a situation, particularly now that we're frozen the prices, that there will be blackouts. There could be. I mean, the thinking at the moment is there won't be, but there are critical uncertainties. An escalation in the Ukraine war, the reversal of the advances the Ukrainian army has made, that would cause problems. A decision by OPEC to aim for a higher oil and then consider gas price targeting as well would cause problems. The French nuclear system at the moment is in dire straits with many plants offline in need of repair. Now, again, the plan and the hope is that they're all coming online again, so it shouldn't be a problem for winter. But that's not guaranteed. This is very old technology. So we are in a position where we are not well hedged for a bad winter. And ironically, we are in a place where we're hoping that global warming this year (laughs) is having a real impact because that would relieve a lot of the price pressure, particularly on heating. Look, I'm sure the Bay Secretary will be looking at the weather reports with much interest. I'd want to move on then to the other kind of element that, of the announcement, which is in fact part of the government's, I think, messaging here was, OK, well, we're going we're gonna to bail out the public today, but we never want to be in this situation again where we have a lack of supply. And there were a number of announcements made on that front. And perhaps the most notable, something you've talked about quite a lot previously, is withdrawing the ban on fracking. Now, what is that potentially going to mean for, for the UK? Well, a year ago, uh, we were the first to raise our voice and say the government needs to stop dithering and start drilling. (laughs) It's been very clear that it was the wrong decision to put a moratorium on onshore drilling using the technique of hydraulic fracturing, which is what fracking is. Now, simply lifting the moratorium is not enough. It's very welcome the government has decided to do that, 
but they've got to look seriously at the entire architecture of planning and permitting restrictions on fracking, but also on other forms of energy supply to speed up how quickly we can do this. At the moment, new sources of supply domestically are not going to happen in a way that will help this winter. I mean, hypothetically, you get some of the existing test drills up in about three to six months, but even that's taking you into spring. The only way to get new gas into the British system at the moment is through international deals. And that is what the government is doing, and this is what it will be trying to do with future trade deals as well. So fantastic, that's good. The fracking stuff starts to make a difference about one to three years down the line, depending on how gung-ho the government <laughs> are in going for it. And everything about this rails against the instincts of the Conservative Party. And to be blunt, also the, the mainstream of the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats, all of whom have been flirting with nimbyism for about 20 to 30 years and essentially turning this country into a place where nothing can ever get done. Now, they've got to reverse that. If they do do that, then we will see fracking happening at about 400 to 1,000 different sites across the country within five years. We will see many more wind farms and solar farms onshore as well as offshore. We will potentially see nuclear sites. If they don't do it, then they're going to get tied up in court every single step of the way. And they'll get tied up on the planning and environmental matters, and they'll get tied up on the climate matters where it refers to fracking. Because what campaigns that like to use lawfare will do is try to use climate legislation as a way of saying this stuff should not be happening regardless of what the government policy actually says. Well, indeed, I think that this is a big risk here when it comes to judicial review. Now, the government talks a lot about that in the context of the, the human rights laws and the need to reform uh, the way that structure works. But they haven't talked so much about it when it comes to the environmental laws, where the government's um, not only obviously got their, their net zero target by 2050 in law, which is having an impact on, on projects. Um, in fact, even uh, my says it led to a delay in the Heathrow um, runway, uh, additional runway. But also the, they're adding with the, the latest environmental law a number of new targets that could all be used in law for purposes in judicial review. And even if they don't have a genuine claim legally, if nothing else, this, this all slows down the process of building the infrastructure and makes it a lot more expensive um, to do so, be, as you've said, be it fracking or onshore wind and solar or uh, as, as a favourite topic of ours, yeah. housing. So, so these, are, these are legacy issues, particularly from May and Johnson's obsession with net zero and the idea that you can centrally plan an end to climate change from one country unilaterally, which is clearly not true. Net, the net zero target itself is in law, but is clearly not legally binding in any meaningful sense. And although the government is not in the place to actually say that, de facto what they have just done means that is true. What they have just done is prioritise security of supply and affordability over decarbonisation. If you're doing that, then the decarbonisation target is not legally binding, not unless you believe that by doing those two other things you'll get to it somehow. Well, you could make an, of course, you could make an optimistic case that, well, in the short run, of course, moving from coal to gas is necessary. You're going to need more gas mm -hmm. supplies um, to smoothen out the way to, to get to net zero, and that it is a transition for fuel. As, as you've said, one of the key reasons why global gas prices are high is not just because of Putin, but also because um, all over the world, people, uh, you know, if you look at a country like China, is moving quite substantially from coal to gas, and to, in order to um, decrease pollution and, and make some kind of contribution to net zero. So gas in itself is something you're going to need as a transition well, that, fuel. That, in the UK, that transition has happened. Um, mm. Coal is an irrelevance at the moment. It's but the, as everyone else does that, then yeah. the global prices are expected to go up. Of gas, certainly. Indeed, yes, yeah. of I gas. Mean, where, where we are in our net zero journey is saying, you know, we can replace gas with renewables and nuclear. And that's certainly true at some point. But the, the trick is we don't really know where mm. and when and how much and how we deal with the intermittency problems and how we deal with the storage problems. And there is this general reluctance from government to admit that they cannot accurately predict this, they cannot plan it, and they are reliant on global markets over which they have no control. Indeed, this is the old trilemma. Can we have yeah. uh, security of supply, uh, low carbon, and as, as well as um, reducing costs 
for consumers. I think another element here the government's also flagged. Now, you've said that they're, they're investigating um, making longer-term contracts when it comes to gas supply, um, and they're going to obviously go out to the, the, the market globally and, and try to sign some deals there. But they're also interested, and there's been some more reporting on this, in terms of reforming the electricity market. Now, in an earlier episode of the IA podcast, we had Dada Helm, who spoke about some of his reform ideas from a few years ago, um, and he, some of his um, solutions in terms of not paying the elevated gas price for um, renewables and for nuclear. Uh, that seems like something the government's also interested in doing. Yeah, so electricity market reform is earth-shatteringly complicated <laughs> and has been made even more complicated over the last 15 years by essentially ratchet policy. As soon as the government started intervening to achieve climate measures, it found that this caused unintended consequences, such as making energy-intensive industries uncompetitive. It then brought in new measures to offset those problems, creating in turn further complications. So we've ended up with what is technically known of as in economic circles as a right mess. <laughs> now, Dieter Helm's report from 2017 made a fantastic effort to solve the problem. It was so good the government decided to ignore it because it would have ra ridden rail shot over many vested interests and those interests were not happy. One of the main interests that weren't happy were renewable generators who were getting a lovely sweetheart deal that they could see that if the gas price ever rose, they were going to make billions absolute fortune and we are now living with the consequences of the failure to deal with that so the, the thing that i think Dieter most got right was the idea that renewables should account for the social cost of their own intermittency they need to pay for their grid connections they need to pay for whatever power is required to offset them when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing now that would put up the typical price of renewables that is currently articulated only through the cost of generation and then only through an average over their entire period through a contract for difference. Um, but it would do so in a way that was honest and then you'd have fair comparison and competition between renewables and gas plus a carbon price. The carbon price itself is another level of complexity. We don't really have one carbon price in the UK economy. We have several dozen and they're all different, and they're not matched, and they're not offset against international competition. So we don't know how much damage they're doing to British industry, but they do impact investment decisions. So all of these things together need to be reviewed properly if the government is serious about electricity market reform, not just reduced to something as glib as we can separate gas and renewables. Well, clearly you could, but it might not be the best thing to do if you actually want the best and cheapest and most efficient forms of decarbonisation if you want the investment to continue. It may or may not be as simple as changing the national spot market into a set of nodal prices or regional prices. But again, Catherine Porter did an excellent breakdown of what the pros and cons of that approach were. But all of these things are in the consideration and the mix, and there will probably need to be a longer consultation than just making a decision tomorrow. But we're going to see what they're going to do. Well, in this very exciting time for energy policy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and explaining that to our, our listeners and our viewers. If you are enjoying uh, the IEA's digital content, I do encourage you to subscribe to the IEA podcast on your chosen podcast provider, as well as the IEA YouTube channel, where we have new videos from uh, uh, the IEA team uh, throughout the week. Thank you for watching. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.